making the switch. Um, today we want to uh, share with you our case that we did uh, on uh, predictive maintenance on railway. And um, it's going to be a, a less technical case, but more about uh, more the conceptually the things we did for this uh, particular client of ours. Um, first, a small introduction. Uh, we are Anchorman. We, uh, we're based in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and we uh, specialize in what we like to call uh, full-stack data excellence, and this encompasses everything from artificial intelligence until data integration, including also things like uh, advice and, and training, because we believe that whenever you, you can build a shiny model, but if you can't bring it into production without your organization actually knowing how to use it, it's pretty worthless. So we do this uh, using three propositions. Uh, Consumer 360, probably familiar to all of you. So here you have your things like uh, hybrid recommendation systems, uh, multi-channel attribution, click path analysis, but also things like chatbots. Uh, you have your 24-7 business, which is uh, predictive and proactive maintenance. Uh, so machine learning on sensor logs and predicting or optimizing uh, processes. And of course, uh, search, match, and find, which is uh, our proposition for uh, deploying and customizing uh, search engine technology like Elasticsearch. So you'll probably hear this a lot today, but uh, we are hiring. We're always looking for good data scientists and engineers. So if you are looking for a, a cool job in Amsterdam, please uh, contact us after the presentation. We also have a stand in the Expo Hall. And uh, just talk to us. So a little bit about the speakers today. Uh, my colleague, Chris Paul, is uh, one of our data scientists. And I'm a, a data engineer at Anchorman. And as you can see, we're struggling with different phases in our lives right now. No, tough crowd. Uh. <laughs> so the Dutch railway system is actually, I don't know if uh, some of you might know, is actually one of the busiest in the world. Um, it is the most used network in Europe, and you virtually have trains riding back to back each day. So it is, a very, as you can see, it's very interconnected, and um, because of this, any failures really cascade throughout the network, causing mayhem and a lot of annoyed travelers. Uh, every year, there are 3.3 million train journeys, and on a daily basis, we see almost 1.2 million travelers. So obviously, it is of a lot of, of great importance uh, to reduce the number of failures because it will uh, influence a lot of lives. Um, the system is, uh, the, the, the network is maintained by a company called ProRail and uh, they uh, delegate the maintenance to subcontractors through a system of fines and bonuses. So this is going to be important later on because uh, whenever a subcontractor overperforms, they get a bonus and when they underperform, they get a fine. So it's your basic SLA. So one of these subcontractors is our client. Uh, Structon Rail is, the, uh, is an international player in the area of uh, railway maintenance. Um, they manage about 40% of the Dutch railway uh, system. Uh, that amounts to 3,006 switches. And um, they have several types of switches. Some of them can be seen here. This is on their test location in Apeldoorn, where they actually test a lot of things. Um, it's interesting stuff. And of course, as you can guess, they are, of course, a perfect candidate for predictive maintenance. Um, of course, the prime reason being less delays and cancelling of trains, thereby improving everyone's lives. I mean, frequent train travelers will, will know. I think in every country, people love to hate the, the, the train company. Um, but of course, also, one of our missions is to make them uh, the leading player uh, in the field of rail maintenance. Because a lot of these uh, functionalities are transferable to, to other countries, but more on that later. Uh, cost reduction, of course. So despite the uh, fines and uh, bonuses system, it is still, of course, uh, 
reason, there's still, of course, reason to cut costs. And last but not least, better preparations for repair personnel. It also improves their lives because, first of all, they can plan better when they need to uh, service something. And they can also come better prepared if they already can kind of, if they know or have at least a good hint at what type of failure it is. So some numbers. Uh, here you see uh, the causes of failures over the past two years. Um, there are, uh, um, so on average a switch fails once a year. That's not a lot. But uh, critically located switches uh, fail more often because they're used more often. They switch more often or flip more often. And uh, reducing the number of switches because they are the biggest, uh, the biggest category of uh, failure causes will already uh, greatly improve the overall uh, network performance, the overall infrastructure performance. So some of the reasons, and these are just some of the reasons for a switch breaking down, uh, or at least the ones that we can predict, are uh, poor adjustment of rolling construction, which means uh, either a construction either flips too far or not far enough. Uh, a flip here we defined as a single switch from left to right or right to left, because otherwise it gets very confusing with switches and switches do switching. So we call them flips. Another one being lack, lack of grease on, uh, on the slides, so they will start creaking after a while. Bent blades due to weather conditions or maybe also uh, heavy use by a lot of trains, freight trains. Uh, bending the, the blades out of, uh, out of shape. And of course you have your whole host of electrical problems. So things like fuses blowing, or uh, although that's pretty acute, uh, but we're not brushes, the motor getting old, things like these. Okay. So let's take a look at the data. Uh, here you can see two flips of the same railway switch. Um, uh, you can see the amperage over time of the electrical engines used for, the, for performing the flip. And uh, this is measured 50 times a second. And Structal knows from experience that a healthy flip should take place within two seconds. That's something just, they just know, they know from experience. And here you can see two examples. On the left-hand side, you can see an example of a healthy flip because it takes place within two seconds. Uh, in the beginning, you can see a high peak that indicates the engine starts. After that, the actual flipping takes place. And finally, the switch is locked and, uh, well, the flip is finished and, in this case, successful. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of a flip, well, that can be seen as a failure because it takes more than two seconds. And also, visually, you can see there's something wrong with this flip. Uh, the high peak at the end of the, during the flip and also the line is a bit more noisy. So something obviously is wrong in here. Um, but that also brings us to some challenges because labeling is done by using a rule. and. Uh, we're not exactly sure what caused the failure. It could have been that uh, something we could have predicted, but it also could be something that's not uh, an unforeseen event. For example, a stone on the tracks or uh, bad weather, etc. That's something you cannot predict. So we have add in this way, using this rule, we add some noise to our train data. So that's one of the, uh, the main challenges we have right now. Also, the data set is pretty skewed. Luckily for Dutch uh, passengers using the Dutch rail, uh, switches don't break down, that, break down that often. So on average, once or twice a year. And uh, well, uh, so we don't have uh, that many examples of failing flips, or uh, failing switches, sorry. Uh, also a third challenge, and that's an important requirement of our customer, is that they ask us not to build a black box. They want a model they can understand, features they can understand. They want to really understand what we're doing and why we come up with certain predictions. So important, uh, important requirement. Uh, the fourth challenge is that it has to be non-intrusive. So we only use indirect measurements, and in this case, the amperage of the, of the electrical engine. Well, that brings us to some, uh, well, uh, that brings us to the problem definition, and our task, basically, is to learn the deviations in the data to uh, indicate an upcoming malfunction. And important for this is that we do this in a right time frame because Structon is not helped that much by saying, well, the, the switch is going to break down tomorrow or in an hour's time. They want a prediction they can incorporate in their normal planning workflow. So 
For them, ideally, it would be something like one to three weeks before the malfunction that they would like to get a prediction saying, well, we think it's going to break down. So that's an important requirement, of course, also a challenge. Well, some of the data that we work with, uh, Structum does the maintenance for about 3,000 switches in the Netherlands. Half of them are fitted with sensors, so about 1,500 uh, switches. They produce uh, 20 million flips each year, and they can produce up to 1,000 uh, data points per flip. Uh, 1,000 data points means that it takes 20 seconds for the flip, so that's uh, way too long. So obviously, if that happens, there's something really wrong with that, with that switch. And uh, this all produces 50 gigabytes of data each year, and we have a history of about three years to work with, to train our model with. Uh, here, again, an uh, example of a healthy flip because it's within the two seconds, within the 100 measurements. And here you can also see some segments. And Structum provided us with some information about where certain events should take place during the flip. So they know this from experience and they have this information for every switch in the Netherlands. For example, the first segment, the blue part, is where the high peak of the engine start should be. So in this case, that's also the fact. During the second and third segment, so the yellow and the green segment is where the actual flipping should take place. And finally, in the red segment, the final segment, is the location where, well, the line should be zero, the flip should be finished, and the switch, switch should have been locked. So in this case, a perfect example. And we can use this information to derive features from. And again, we use very simple features because that's one of the requirements of Structon. So we derive from each segment uh, some basic features like the min, the max, the average, the length, and the difference compared to the previous flip. And we also have some features for the entire flip. For example, the day since the last failure and the temperature during the flip. That's also something we measure. So uh, simple features because, well, that, that's one of the requirements. But maybe in the future we will look at more interesting features or more uh, complicated features. Well, after this step in pre-processing, we have a feature factor with the absolute values for each segment, for each feature. But because we want to use uh, data from every switch, we normalize the data. So that's one of the first steps we do. Uh, we normalize the data and we use a sliding window to account for the seasonal influences in the data. And finally, the last step in pre-processing is the aggregations by day, because now we have the data per flip, but Structon asked us to predict in terms of days ahead. So that's well, an important step in our pre-processing. And finally, we have a feature factor with the averages of the day, the aggregates of the day. And we use the functions you can see here on the slide. Well, after this step, there's only one step to do. Uh, we convert the days until failure to classes. As you can see here, we define five classes where the 7 to 21 day class is the most important one. Uh, because that's the time frame Structon uses for their planning. So that's an important one, and we want to perform well in this class. And with this data, we train a decision tree. And again, with the reason we want to keep it simple, the output, of course, is really visual and easy to explain to people. Uh, this is a dummy tree, uh, because, of course, Structon doesn't want us to share our uh, output with, uh, with everybody. So, uh, and we think with the decision tree, we have something that's, well, Structon asks us to keep it simple and explainable, and we think with the decision tree, we, uh, we, we do this. So currently, this is the, this is the architecture. It's admittedly very simple. Um, this all runs on a MS SQL database. Um, but it is already implemented in Spark. And uh, of course, our next step will be to move to a fully distributed file system, something like MapR, where we can really leverage and ingest all the data and uh, also use all the historical data that we already have. So in case you needed some convincing, why do we do this in Spark? Well, of course, uh, there is a lot of data prep and feature computation in here. Uh, the uh, sensor readings are encoded in a hexadecimal string that needs to be converted. And then we need to do all the feature computation that uh, Chris already mentioned. Uh, there will be more switches added in the future, uh, at least nationwide and possibly even European-wide. Uh, of course, you have the interactive mode where uh, our data scientists will improve their models on a cluster using the real data. And there are also uh, some interesting streaming scenarios to be thought of. So in this case, that would be um, trying to detect short-term failures, so just before they break down, and actually sending messages to repair personnel that are near this particular switch. 
thereby reducing downtime even further and preventing fines. So looking at the confusion matrix, what you see here is uh, the uh, two classes where the corresponding to the five classes Chris showed you before, we took the seven to 21 days class as the positive class and all the other classes as negative because they are, would, regardless of whether it's a failure or not, they are not interesting at the moment for Structon to uh, plan to account for because then either they break down and they have to act upon it and or it's too far in the future. So it's only this time frame that, that gives uh, Structon a comfortable uh, planning window. So here you can see uh, in this case uh, this switch, so this was trained on a single switch, a uh, switch that broke that breaks down very often because it's, in a, it's also in a very critical point. And we use that to train our model and then test it on a, another switch that also breaks down very often. Well, here you can see the switch broke down within our time frame 87 times. Uh, this gives us a recall of 73%, 73.5%. 73, but this might seem a little bit low, but keep in mind that this also includes the failures that, don't, that are not shown in the data. So also the things like uh, weather influences or um, stones on the, on, the on, the, on the switch. Of course, though, it is for now a little bit of cherry picking, but uh, we're looking to improve upon this to, um, uh, as soon as we uh, roll it out nationally and incur even more data and also outfit more switches with sensors. So when we've shown this to Structon, um, they were actually very happy already with this recall percentage because of the fines. Uh, for them, sending a mechanic, maybe sometimes for no uh, superfluously, is uh, still a lot cheaper than actually incurring a fine. So for them, recall is really important. So this is something that we also uh, took away from this case is that Precision and recall are actually concepts that you can very easily explain to the business. So these are two parameters that they can tune themselves and that they understand conceptually in order to uh, drive the uh, data science project. So, and in this case, clearly recall is more important because of the fine structure. And after that comes cost optimizing. some uh, future work uh, we're planning on. Uh, of course, now we have finished uh, our baseline system with a very simple model, um, but we also want to try something else, for example, deep learning. And one of the requirements was not to build a black box, and maybe with deep learning we do the opposite, but uh, it will be interesting to see if we can improve the performance and also maybe try other, uh, other models or other uh, techniques, for example, regression. It will be interesting to see the results of that. Uh, another interesting next step is to predict the type of failure. We think we see some patterns in data that indicate uh, a motor malfunction or something mechanical. So the, the patterns are there in the data, but in order to do this, we need better labels, but because now it's based on a, on a rule, more than 100 measurements or less. Uh, so we need better labels. And Structon started with registering all failures and writing down what actually caused the failure. So with this, with this information, we can look better at uh, predicting the type of failures, but also improving our current system because with better labels we get a well, better opportunity to, to evaluate our model. So that's an interesting next step to take. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so other next steps of course are uh, bring the, so this is bring this in production even further, uh, thereby also switching at least to a batch and serving layer in a, a Lambda architecture based upon uh, a distributed file system. And uh, then we will continue with a nationwide rollout um, and possibly even European. So we are planning this with Structon. And um, yeah, I think the, uh, the takeaway here is that uh, by really applying predictive maintenance on cases like this, you can really influence millions of lives because overall the downtime in the, of the switches uh, goes down. So, we're quite fast. Uh, any questions? Um, see some over there. It 
was not so clear if you are filtering uh, the effect of the weather now, or are you planning to do it in the future? The, sorry, I didn't quite get the first part. The so, are you already filtering the effect of the weather? or you are planning to do that in yeah, the well, future? We're trying to get the, the information of the weather very locally, so what actually was the weather during a, a flip. But now we only have the temperature, so that doesn't help us that much. Of course, it gives some indication. Uh, but we're yeah, also looking at other data sources. Now we just use the temperature and the, the measurements, but it would be interesting to see the, the, also the location of the flip, of the, of the switch, sorry, to see if that's something, if, if that's relevant, but also the weather would be very, very relevant, I think. Thank you. Yeah, no, and, and I think I'd, I'd like that we, we are not filtering out the, the seasonal influences because, uh, that, uh, because it's an indirect measurement that has an influence on the amount of energy the, uh, the motor uses because we're only measuring the amperage. So we, the sliding window is to not discard the seasonal influences. Any other questions? Wow. Lots of questions. <laughs> uh, hello. Are you Hi. thinking maybe to extend, uh, except for the amber, to measure also other kind of qualitative or quantitative characteristics of the engine or of the train uh, in terms of uh, uh, shortage? So extend, I heard you until extend. Uh, to extend uh, in any kind of qualitative or quantitative uh, characteristics of the engine or of the railway. Uh, ah, yes, and you mean quite, uh, things like positional information. Yes. And, uh, yeah, because that would be positional information would actually be a big, uh, a big feature. Uh, for now, not, because these, this means uh, investing for Structon uh, in the uh, current sensors. So for now, we are first showing value with the sensors that we have. And then later, we can think about extending the, uh, the range of sensors. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think you, you asked if we, are, uh, if we will look at other uh, aspects of the switch that we can measure, right, and then use it in our models. And uh, the answer is currently not, because we don't have that data. We, have, we only have this, this kind of sensor data, but uh, if, uh, this is already showing value, so that might be in the future definitely a wise step to take, yes. Hello, uh, could you elaborate a bit more on the choice of the lambda architecture? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so in this case it is a, uh, we need to, uh, we, well it's basically training on historical data and then uh, use the streaming layer to provide the functionality of sending uh, the, uh, sending the messages to the re uh, repair personnel on time. That would be, that would be it. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, since you have um, a few examples of failures, did you try any uh, synthetic sampling like uh, the smooth technique or something like that to enhance your uh, few, few failures? Yeah, and if it shows, if it have good results or it have no value at all. Um, let's see. If, if I get your question, if, if if we can, well, I didn't quite get the first. If you use any synthetic uh, sampling. sampling. Okay. Well, no, no. To be honest, no. We didn't try that. Uh, we first started with this, and we'll because we are also getting better labels. Probably we'll wait for that to to, to get better labels. And we're also looking at, uh, well, yeah, it could be interesting to, to try that uh, to get better data and to, to, to look at the failures better. Yeah. Thank you for the talk and for the use case that you reported. I have a one question about the results. I was wondering uh, how the company managed the failure. So before you, you came in, how, what was the solution? and how your solution improved their performance before? Well, yeah, of course, good question. Uh, important, of course. No, now they still do uh, uh, maintenance on, on schedule. So every month or every two months they, they perform maintenance. And they don't really have tr uh, records of how this would, would improve their uh, system because we just started. And of course they, they are continuing with their current uh, 
periodic maintenance. So we're looking at how, how we can evaluate our system fairly. So that's, that's also something of the yeah, next steps. Because in our data, sometimes you can see uh, uh, some, some deviations in the data, and then all of a sudden the, the, the failure is gone, or the deviations are gone because of the periodic maintenance. So it's very difficult to, to, to say, well, how much does this system improve? But we think we can, we can uh, predict a lot of malfunction failures that now are unnoticed. So, but to give you a number, it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to do. So that's something we're going to do in the next period. I think I, I'd like to add to that. That's, that's a typical uh, example of how a, something you build, a model which, with fairly new technology, uh, needs to be uh, carried within your organization. So now we have to, uh, using these results, we, we are now uh, gathering momentum within Structon for them to actually uh, change their, uh, their maintenance schedules and do it more on the basis of this data. So this is a slow process. Uh, hello. Uh, you show this curve about the time it takes uh, to flip uh, the switch and the voltage. Uh, you said, <laughs> yes, that one. Yeah. So basically you said it's just the time it takes that makes the difference, but you also mentioned visually we can see uh, it's not exactly the yeah. same. Imagine uh, it takes the same time, but visually you can identify there is a problem. Do you plan to do the pre-processing or the feature extraction in Spark? Or you will do the signal processing before, like with R or whatever, and do then the learning in Spark? What can be your advice on that? Uh, well, we, we, we are doing it with Spark because it is, it is so, much, uh, so much data. And I think especially this kind of feature extraction and uh, more conventional, it's almost conventional ETL. But because you, you just take the time here, it's kind of simple. But imagine you had to do that with a more uh, advanced signal processing job, I would say. No, do you do that in, in Spark? We, we are not, we are not, uh, ex so the times, times are, the time is just more, uh, it is abstract time because it's actually the number of measurements. So it's di discretized. So there are actually, there are measurement tuples. That and we are, uh, we are looking at that curve as a whole. And from that, okay. we are creating our feature vector. Okay, so you also take the shape and the peaks and so on? Well, it's, Im it's, implied. it's implied in the, in okay, the data. Okay. And yeah. you do that in Spark? Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, do you think about uh, automatic labeling like uh, probabilistic clusterization, etc. I think for your data, it potentially should work. Um, so have we thought about uh, what kind of clustering? Uh, 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 probabilistic clustering. Probabilistic. Ah, yeah, yes, that could work, yes, but that, is, uh, that also has to do with, uh, uh, yeah, th with that way we could improve our data quality, for sure, and then uh, kind of look at the clusters that come from it and label it. That's what you mean, right? And then use that to train our supervised models. Yes. Yes, it would. Hello. I have one question about the labeling or the population that you have. What's the percentage that you use to train your model with failures in this case? Sorry, the, diff the percentage of failures that, that you have in your training set. Well, on average, you, um, I have to think. Well, on average, most most flips, uh, most switches break down once or twice a year, uh, but some of them more. But uh, the percentage, uh, one percent, something like that, less uh, than that probably. Yeah. Okay. And um, w which model you use to predict? I didn't get. Well, we, we now use a decision tree because it's very simple to use and visually. Uh, but of course, we want to try more and more sophisticated models. But this is something Structon understands because we have a nice output. It's something they can understand. And well, of course, we'll be cur we're curious to see how we can improve that with more advanced algorithms. We are Thank also you. looking at things like inductive, uh, inductive learning, so transfer learning, to try to increase the population of failures and, and try to kind of like make more of the data. Okay, right. Thank you. 
I think time for just one more question, maybe. Just gentleman there. over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, first of all, nice presentation. Um, question about your choice for uh, the decision tree. You mentioned uh, you don't want a black box. Um, but at the same time, how much do you think Structon would care about understanding the contents of the black box if the performance is that much better? Yeah. Good, good question. This is also why we want to look at deep learning. Yeah. 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 But one, one interesting aspect is that a lot of mechanics work well the entire life for Structon. And uh, if they go, say, well, we predict a, a failure, and they go to the site, and they want some information because, well, how, how do they believe us? Why do they believe us? So it's interesting for us to say, well, we think because the, the max value in segment one is very high, it's something they can understand and something, well, we, we can uh, explain to them why we predict certain things. So that's one, also one of the reasons. Uh, Right, then I'm very curious how you're going to explain it using deep learning. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to impress them with the results and then see if we can win them over. But yeah. for now, so, so this is a really like a conventional engineering company, right, in the hardware sense. So you need to convince them first with really explain to them why it works. And they see it as black magic a little bit. So you have to watch out. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Time for lunch, and uh, we'll resume this track at 1.45. Thank you. Bye-bye.